Sonic the Hedgehog, the only thing in this world more divisive than politics. Of course, when it comes to this franchise, there is two distinct eras typically acknowledged. There is the classic era, mostly containing the series' formative side-scrollers, and the modern era, ranging anywhere from masterpieces to some of the worst games of all time. Typically, the classic era contains the 2D games, and the modern era games are 3D, but this rule isn't always the standard. In the modern era, we've seen a handful of 2D Sonic games, such as Sonic 4 and Sonic Mania. And you might think, well, well there's, there's no way the inverse of that can be true. There were no 3D games back in the era of side-scrollers. Games used to be so simple compared to what we have now, so how could it be? Well, the answer is, it depends on what you consider 3D. It's, of course, subjective. The game we're going to look at today is Sonic 3D Blast, released in holiday of 1996. Uh, excuse me, this game isn't 3D. Dude, it has 3D in its title. It plays in a three-dimensional, isometric angle. But yeah, technically it's stretching the definition a bit, and the isometric angle kind of cheats since it doesn't have to render a whole world as a result. And while some games even did this as far back as the Atari 2600, uh, but this is, by accounts, the first 3D Sonic game, technically. And if you disagree with me, well, I'm just some stranger on the internet. Who cares? Sonic 3D Blast was released in 1996 for the Sega Genesis and Sega Saturn. This game was developed by Traveler's Tales, who nowadays are known for making the LEGO video games, which are typically highly praised. Hey, I said typically. Traveler's Tales started working with Sega after they took interest in the Toy Story games they developed, which ended up being one of the primary influences for Sonic 3D Blast's development. The two companies maintained a pretty good relationship, also creating Sonic R and working together until Super Monkey Ball Adventure. And then they stopped working together after that game, and uh, yeah, I, I, I wonder why. Sonic 3D Blast was originally only developed for the Sega Genesis. However, it's important to note that technically it wasn't the main Sega console, and was on its way out. Sonic Team was busy working on a killer app for the newly released Sega Saturn, known as Sonic Xtreme, supposed to be the first real 3D Sonic game. It was played in a fisheye view for some reason, and I don't know, honestly, even looking at this gameplay kind of makes me feel sick to my stomach. Of course, for the time, the gameplay we do have to look at is definitely respectable, but due to an extremely troubled development history, the game was shelved, leaving the Sega Saturn with no holiday game in 96. But hold your horses! Why don't we just take Sonic 3D Blast on Genesis, add slightly better graphics, a different soundtrack, add a few bells and whistles, and bam, you have a Sonic game. A 3D one out, no less, for the Sega Saturn. It isn't that just so shameful, getting something out easier as you work on a much larger project. What? I mean, this is kind of weird if you really think about it. If they really wanted it to be on the Sega Saturn, they should have just made this an exclusive title. Because if you put it on both, everyone who has a Genesis already is going to have really no incentive to buy the new console. We'll discuss the differences in depth a bit later, but for now, let's just take a look at the Genesis version. Starting up the game, we see this really well-animated 3D cutscene. And you know, I'm sure this looked really good in 1996, but God is this dated nowadays. Upon pressing start, we get introduced to this game's story. Yeah, a Sonic game with a story. Well, all Sonic games usually had some story. They were more so just tucked in the manual, or you would see little elements of the story progress in the gameplay, like Sonic the Hedgehog 3. And considering 3D Sonic games usually integrate a story like their life depends on it from here, it's a precursor in a way. Although, it's nothing groundbreaking. It's a simple story, something you might see in a Saturday morning cartoon or something of that nature. You see, this game takes place in an alternate dimension, ooh! No Green Hill Zone, no Casino Night Zone, nothing like that. Seven entirely new zones. It's here that Dr. Robotnik finds the Flickies, these little birds who can travel between large rings. He wants to use them to make them look for the Chaos Emeralds somehow and conquer the world. I don't know, this plot doesn't make any sense. Sonic gets to the island, uh, for some reason, realizes the Flickies are trapped inside the robots, and makes it his quest to save them, using the Flickies to travel between the aforementioned giant rings. Um, so this is, like, this is just kind of Sonic 1, right? Like, you, you hit the enemy, a little animal comes out. We're really not treading too much new ground here, aren't we? Ultimately, the story is whatever. We don't really have to care. It's a Sonic game. Even nowadays, I think people care a bit too much about the story in these games. It's a cute little hedgehog. Does it really matter? If the gameplay is good, that's all that matters to me, personally. Sonic 3D Blast ultimately takes a lot of the series' conventions that were already established from the first four games. Except, well, 
It's in 3D. As mentioned, the game controls from an isometric angle. And you know what? I think it works okay, but it's not a perfect system. Figuring out what's a hitbox and what's something you die touching is really challenging. I feel like you don't get much depth perception here. A lot of the times when jumping on an enemy, it feels like you're sort of just taking a leap of faith. It's hard to line up exactly where you want to go as well. An example of this is when this game tries to introduce precision platforming. It's really rough. I don't know why they did this here. Uh, thankfully, sections where you need to jump between platforms are fairly rare and not always required, but they do exist. And you'll either need to be a geometry expert to do it or try and try again a hundred times until you finally nail it. They did add to try these little shadows underneath every object to remedy this, which doesn't really help as much as the game developers might have thought they did. It was a newer era at the time, and it's fair to think that this could have been a decent remedy. Occasionally, there's these giant ramps where Sonic loses a bunch of speed if you try to go up by running. Instead, you need to bounce on these little trampolines the ramp spits in and out, but getting the timing for it and the angle proves to be very difficult. Of course, this is because the Genesis controller is, well, a D-pad, which ultimately becomes one of the game's largest restrictions. You're often locked into a diagonal angle where sometimes you need to go straight and it doesn't always work the way you would hope it does. Other than that, you don't have a ton of other moves in your arsenal. You do get a spin dash, which was taken from the later 2D Sonic games, and this is one of the most important moves I think you have. What's good about the spin dash is that you can use this to run into enemies. This proves to be very helpful when you might be worried about jumping on an enemy and missing its hitbox. It also works with like barely any speed. You know, I'm not, I'm not complaining, but how did that work? Each level is more or less structured as the following. You enter a field and you're tasked with finding five flickies. As mentioned, they pop out if you kill an enemy and there's very rarely additional enemies or anything. So if you see a robot, it's 100% what you need to kill. The different flickies act in different ways. The little birds that look like the bird from Twitter will try to find you. I'm guessing this is because you're both blue. The red flickies don't want you around and try to avoid you. I'm gonna say this is a diss at Super Mario Brothers. It, it probably isn't, whatever. The pink flickies follow you as well in bigger circles. Uh, let's just say that's a reference to Amy Rose, and the green flickies will pretty much try to avoid you. Bastards. Oftentimes, it feels like you just jump and run past them. And they don't really feel different from another. I, honestly, I didn't even notice this was a thing until I sat down and did my research on these enemies. A decent number of other things return from the 2D Sonic games. For one, each zone is broken into three acts. The first two are the same kind of thing, and the third is a boss. I don't think the bosses work super well in this game, although it largely depends. There are some fights against Dr. Robotnik where you fight him in a largely open field. These aren't too bad, as having a lot of space to maneuver and retreat is very helpful, and Robotnik gives you quite a lot of moments where you can't attack him. However, I don't like when the bosses try to be cutting edge or creative in these small spaces, because they don't work too well in this gameplay style. The boss of Rusty Room Zone is specifically one I wanted to mention here. You need to ride up these little stone platforms, but if you're not lined up perfectly when you get to the top, which again is challenging because of the controls and not wanting to fall off, you take damage. And since these areas are very small, it's very easy to run out of rings super quickly. Here's where I'm going to point out that this game doesn't have a built-in save system. It's one of those, you gotta beat it in one giant sitting type of situation. Something that's fine, but yeah, not huge on it personally. Which, for the early Sonic games, I get a bit more, as they were fresh off the NES and Atari type of games. But like, this game came out in 1996. This is two years before Sonic Adventure released. And over a decade after Legend of Zelda, which had a built-in save system. Considering this game's more explorative nature and scope, I really think this game should have had a better continue system, at least have a password or something. I don't know, listen, it's 2022, okay? I'm spoiled now. I wouldn't be surprised if some people prefer this style of gameplay just for the purity and retro feel, and it is a grind that makes you feel accomplished if you do beat it. That's great, but honestly, playing these games nowadays with that restriction feels really annoying. That being said, there are decent opportunities to get extra lives. Per usual, 100 rings will get you an extra life, and it feels easier to get to 100 in most of the zones. Now that it's in 3D, there's a lot more of them lying around. There are also these, uh, what I assume are extra lives on these bouncy pads, but ugh, mm, I, don't, I don't know how to get these. I tried timing my press better in vain I had to reach, but never would, and these are fairly frequent, so I didn't know how to get these at first. I'm positive I'm missing something, like, really obvious, but, I, oh, God. Okay, this kept bothering me. I did research. These boxes are the one-ups. I don't remember finding these too often, to be honest. So what are these floating heads if they aren't one-ups? How do you reach them? 
Well, these aren't one-ups uh, per se, these are sonic medals, and the way you reach them is when you have the five flickies with you, as only then do they give you the extra height. I didn't know about this at all. I, I guess that's obvious? I don't know, it's not a serious fault of the game, but I do wish this was explained a bit better, So I beat this whole game not getting a single one. If you get ten of them, you get to continue. So there you go, there's there's some continue system in this game. It would have been nice to know before I recorded all of this footage. Getting back to the rings, these do serve multiple purposes. First and foremost, just like the classic games, you were given an extra hit of damage as long as you have one ring with you. Upon getting hit, the rings splatter and disperse, but re-getting them, especially with the isometric angle, is really difficult, honestly. Oftentimes, I would appear to go right through them, leaving me quite defenseless moving through the level, and if that happens in a boss fight, you're kind of just screwed. But usually, you have a good amount of rings when you get hit, meaning that you'll usually get one or two back. It's just when you're relying on one that this gets painful, unlike the Genesis titles where often you really could just rely on one ring to get you through an entire act. The secondary purpose to these rings is that you can meet Tails or Knuckles in these little alleyways, give them rings, this reminds me of a drug deal by the way, and then you get transported to a bonus level where you're tasked with getting a certain amount of rings, where you're rewarded with Chaos Emeralds. Again, just like the classic games more or less. Insert obligatory statement here that these graphics are very impressive for the Sega Genesis's standards. Alongside the rings, most of the classic Sonic items return as well, being the shields. They're even elemental. The red shield lets you swim through lava, a near necessity in this zone. There's also the invincibility power-up, which is super nice to have. Each zone differs quite a lot in terms of graphics. You got your Green Hill-esque zone. Here it's called Green Grove. <gasps> But besides that, nothing's too similar to the 2D games. There's some neat looking levels here to appreciate. I especially like Volcano Valley Zone. It's one of the first lava levels in a Sonic game, which doesn't feel too boring and still maintains that Sonic charm to it. I also really like Diamond Dust Zone, which is your standard ice level, but still feels unique and interesting. I love these little snowmen minions. And of course, music-wise, this game's awesome. I mean, it's a Sonic game after all. What else do you want me to say? The zone I really wanted to like was Spring Stadium Zone. It's a child playroom type of level, which is pretty cool, but honestly, it's kind of weird to navigate this. Oftentimes, there are these parts of the levels you think you can access, but you actually can't, and it's just kind of an illusion. It's not always clear what's the background and what's the main floor you can move on. That being said, while I really like the presentation of how each zone looks and sounds, I gotta be honest, I think the biggest issue with Sonic 3D Blast is there's really not a ton of variety. Almost every level could be swapped with another, barring a few minor exceptions. But uh, it's the type of game where if you don't like level one, you're really not gonna like the game anymore by level seven. I'd say Sonic 3D Blast is a very bare minimum of keeping things fresh. Technically, each zone has some new gameplay elements. Rusty Room Zone, for example, makes you Beyblade through rocks. There are the ice physics, the floor is lava, you move switches, and some levels in the light game don't even do the flicky thing and just have you run in the end. But in general, you're more or less just doing the same thing. It comes off as a bit repetitive. You get to the <coughs> final boss after playing the seven zones, which honestly is really difficult. You have to time your movement perfectly, indicated by these little blue buttons on the side of Dr. Robotnik's contraption. This goes on for three rounds, and for a minute you might feel a semblance of satisfaction, but if you didn't get all the KS Emeralds, it's not the real ending of the game. Haha, <laughs> you just wasted your time. I hate games that do this. I beat the game, go screw yourself. As mentioned earlier, there was also a Sega Saturn release of this game. The games remain largely the same, with the Sega Saturn version being more graphically impressive and advanced. It does look better, of course, but some areas look a little washed out in comparison to the Genesis version. It's a little darker. To be honest, I don't think the Saturn version is mind-blowing or anything. It certainly looks better than the Genesis's version, to be fair. But to be honest, if you look at these two games and the consoles that they were originally released on, I might actually say 
3D Blast is more impressive when you consider it's on the Genesis. This feels kind of like a Breath of the Wild situation on a much larger scale, though. As a Saturn title, it's a little underwhelming. The Saturn version also lends itself to an entirely different soundtrack, which is considered to be the definitive version of these tunes. The Saturn version also takes liberties to add a map when pausing, which, you know what? I was gonna mention this during my main critique of the Genesis version until I found out it was added here. Uh, yeah, this is actually a huge benefit, as in the Genesis version, it was very, very easy to get lost and not know where to go. The special stage where he uses graphics from the failed Sonic Extreme game, using a cute little 3D model of classic Sonic, that's pretty much it. The Saturn version is pretty much the exact same game, and it had a development cycle of like seven weeks or something, and was fairly rushed, so you can't expect anything too different. You might think that's where we'd call it a day, but there is one more version we have to talk about, kind of? In 2017, the founder of Traveler's Tales, John Burton, made a hack of his own game, and it was released on Steam via a mod pack. This is pretty notable, just for the fact that these sort of things don't always happen, at least by someone who worked on the original project, but he released this version unofficially. Uh, thankfully, Sega didn't sue him or anything. There are a ton of version differences here, making Sonic 3D Blast almost a new game. For one, finally there's a world map where you can save along with completion statuses, changing the entire dynamics of the original game. There's a time trial mode now, a level editor, he added Super Sonic, and even a cut enemy. Aw, look at this guy. So basically my advice to you if you want to play Sonic 3D Blast is, uh, yeah, forget the Genesis version, forget the Saturn version if that was even an option for you, forget the re-releases on the millions and millions of Genesis collections, just get yourself a PC, USB controller, play this mod. This is by far the best way to play Sonic 3D Blast, and if you're at all curious and don't care about authenticity, this is the way to go when it's semi-official. It was kind of. Anyways, that's a wrap on Sonic 3D Blast. I think it's a fine game. It's not the best game that ever existed, nowhere near the best Sonic game, but you know what? It's nowhere near the worst Sonic game. I can name probably 10 that are worse than this. It's pretty antiquated nowadays, but if you have the time, it's a cute little game to spend an afternoon with, and it's technically a classic Sonic game. At the very least, it's inoffensive. Uh, I don't know. Someone will, someone will find something to get offended over. It's, it's the internet. I should, I should take that back right now. Thank you.